Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? This time around, I'm wearing a really bright shirt again and we're talking about digital cameras. There are a whole bunch of different directions that I could take a podcast topic like this. And maybe I'll explore some of the other aspects to where cameras are and where they're going in a future episode. But I figure, at least for this time around, I'd give you just a little bit of context about maybe how my interaction with cameras and photographic equipment has been and some of the challenges that I've been facing lately with regard to continuing to put out content on my YouTube channel that meets the quality standards that I expect without like tearing my hair out in the process. Obviously, you know, as time goes on, the progression of technology means that we're going to get things that are better and faster and higher quality and hopefully lower cost. And when it comes to cameras, we've definitely been hitting a lot of these bullet points. Cameras have been getting much better in terms of quality, not just their resolution, but in terms of low light capability, shutter speeds, the, the ability to take multiple photos in succession very rapidly, like burst mode types of still photography. And also in video, we've seen the advent of video really getting added into still cameras and pushing those cameras to a completely different market and different use cases than they've ever been before. I mean, I remember just maybe 12 years ago when I bought my first digital SLR video, taking video on it wasn't even an option. And even as of 2009, 2010, video was still kind of in its infancy on what were otherwise still cameras. It's really only been in the last few years that video has taken off. And I think it's been a good thing because it not only gives these cameras extra value, but it also helps push the manufacturers to develop their cameras even more. You know, you look at film cameras from say the 80s and the 90s and even the early 2000s, and there wasn't a huge amount of progression of that technology, right? Like the biggest thing I can think of from film cameras as an innovation really was just the advent of autofocus. Whereas now you look at digital cameras and the ability to capture not just high definition, but 4K video. And then you push that even further and now we're looking at 360 degree video for VR and that sort of thing. That's just the kind of progression that you know only time can give you. Of course, it's pushed people into, into wanting to use the technology in new and different ways. And truth be told, if digital cameras didn't offer video capabilities, I probably wouldn't even be a YouTuber. The workflow of dealing with tape off of a video camera, like old school, you know, video cassette tapes, would be just way too inconvenient for me or probably most other YouTubers to ever really even want to deal with. So we've seen these just major advancements in camera technology and the cameras have taken on all these different form factors and shapes and sizes and of course now price points. But what I've found is there really still is no one perfect in quotation marks camera, at least not for my use case. Now I like to think of how I use and interact with cameras as being actually fairly typical for a YouTube channel, for you know my type of content creation, where I'll need a camera that's gonna give me really good video quality, but also be fairly flexible. Not just being able to do quick, short, you know, bursts of video like I need to do just you know, a 10 or 15 second product shot, but also to be really versatile and do longer form type of clips like what I'm shooting now. And then to offer lots of creative options as to how to present that video, not just kind of a basic flat, you know, maybe 1080p or 4K picture, but to be able to really let me push my creative boundaries. And 
it's it's kind of surprising for me that there really aren't any manufacturers that are putting all of the features together to make a camera that hits all of that those bullet points. So it's been a struggle for me over the last few years to try and work my way to a point where I've got a camera or a camera system that does what I need it to do. I've started out with a whole hodgepodge of different cameras. And of course, I was still developing my own video or presentation style. So, you know, in some ways at that point, the camera doesn't really matter. And I should note that even now, in some ways, I believe that the camera doesn't necessarily really matter. I mean, your skills need to be able to fulfill what the camera can offer, at least in my opinion, before it's worth looking at an upgrade. There are still plenty of YouTube channels out there that shoot with very simple or inexpensive cameras. There are entire YouTube channels that shoot entirely on an inexpensive GoPro. There are also even some YouTube channels that I follow that shoot everything off of a phone or an iPad, tablet, something like that. One great example is the channel BigClive.com. If you're interested in electrical engineering, his channel is really fun to watch. He basically buys a bunch of cheap junk off of eBay and tears it down and explains not only how it works, but how it's likely incredibly dangerous from an electrical safety kind of perspective. But he shoots almost all of his episodes either on a smartphone or a tablet. And I think he might even do all of his editing directly on those devices as well. And yet he's got several hundred thousand subscribers. And these videos are not put together in a very like complicated way. It's usually just a single shot pointing straight down at his desk. And he just shows you what he's working on start to finish with really minimal edits or creative work in between. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't really come down necessarily to always having the fanciest, most expensive equipment. You need to have compelling content to be really good at what you do, or at least be able to be good at telling stories before I feel you can actually start to think about graduating on. Case in point, I'm actually shooting this entire episode on my iPhone. I've never done this before, and I'm curious to see how it'll work. I can tell looking at the preview that I'm not very thrilled with the actual like image style that this is. It looks very flat. The background behind me is still very much, you know, in focus. It's not you don't get that nice depth that you normally would out of a camera. But, you know, if all you have is a smartphone and you want to get started into content creation, just roll with it. You need to start somewhere. But as time has on, gone on, I've wanted to express myself in additional creative ways, not just in terms of the stories that I tell, but how I tell them. And so I started going down in some ways the rabbit hole of buying camera equipment. Around, I'd like to say the summer of 2015, I don't remember exactly when, I made my first major purchase for the channel, and it was this guy, a Sony RX10. Now this is what they call a bridge camera. It is technically mirrorless because there's no mechanical like mirror flapping up and down like you'd see on a DSLR. But for all of its strengths, it still has some weaknesses. First is while it's got an incredible built-in lens, it's got a nice, I believe 24, 28 to 200 millimeter focal range and it's constant f2.8 aperture, which is really, really useful creatively. It does have a one inch image sensor in there, which cuts down on how much light it can take in, but also cuts down on the depth of field effect that you can get. Everything kind of like with the shot you're looking at now can tend to seem a little bit flatter. You don't get that nice blurred background with sharp foreground. It's, it's tougher to do that with this camera. Not impossible, but tougher. Another bummer with this camera is the way the screen on the back operates. It doesn't work very well for sale selfies. In fact, I've never used this camera for a podcast episode simply because Sony doesn't like to do the flip out style LCD screen. They really only do tilt up and down. And this is an issue that Sony still has to this day 
with one small exception, which I'll get to in a moment. Also, another problem with a lot of these cameras is that they have limited recording length times. This one is limited to 30 minutes at a shot when you're doing video. Basically, you can start recording and you can do one single clip for 30 minutes and then the camera will stop recording automatically and you have to press the record button again. Well, if I wanted to do a big long take, maybe if I was doing an interview with someone or I just wanted to have a seamless podcast episode without a whole bunch of jump cuts in the middle, well, that's kind of a limiting factor. I'd you know, want a nice seamless long clip. So the RX-10 is a great camera and it was a great camera when I bought it for what I needed, but I found that as the channel grew and creatively my priorities changed, that it no longer really met all of my needs. So I went and I purchased another camera. And admittedly, the other camera ended up being more of a complement than a replacement. And it was my Sony A5100. I stuck with Sony because I knew I'd be keeping the RX-10 around and going with this camera lets me match footage. There have been episodes that I've edited and put up where I've actually used both of these cameras and it's really difficult to tell the difference of the footage from which one, right? And it's been a great camera for a lot of the product kind of shots. I'm able to creatively get a lot of what I'm looking for out of this camera. Now, why I went specifically with the A5100 is it has a tilt up screen. So this has come in very useful when shooting things like these podcast episodes because I can set the camera up and actually be able to frame it you know, with me in the shot. I don't like to say that I take selfies or selfie video in quotation marks, but that's effectively what this is and what I need in order to, you know, pull off some of the shots that I need to pull off. So it's been useful. There have been, of course, downsides to this camera as well. One of them being it is a bit more basic in terms of its features. This camera, even though it's got the nice flip up screen, and the ability to control it over Wi-Fi, including video mode, which is actually something that around its era, not many Sony cameras could do. You could control them for still photos, but really not for video. One major limitation, and I've actually done an episode about this, is the record length time, but in regards to overheating. Something really interesting with the Sony Alpha series of cameras is that they run a small embedded version of Android and it's so you can install add-on applications to the camera. So you can go and buy, download, say a time-lapse app and install it directly on the camera. Well, a bunch of very smart people figured out how to jailbreak that Android installation effectively and wrote an application that lets you turn off the 30 minute clip length limitation. It's called Open Memories Tweak. And after that came out, I figured this camera would be phenomenal for my needs because it would be effectively the same as a large video camera with unlimited recording length, but the real flexibility of interchangeable lenses and really, really good video quality. The downside is that the hardware really tends to let this camera down because while in software you can set it to record unlimited, I think like by the nature of the app, it stops after something like six or eight hours, which is definitely more than I would ever need. The problem and what the topic of that previous episode was about was the fact that this camera has the tendency to overheat while shooting video. Before I did any sort of hardware modifications to this camera, I was lucky to get maybe 14 minutes of continuous shooting before the camera displayed a warning and a few minutes later powered itself off due to too high of an internal temperature. In that video, I tried to take the camera apart and address the thermal situation inside. I figured that, you know, maybe there was something going on inside here, not enough thermal paste or too thin a thermal pad or chips that needed additional cooling, something like that. And long story short, I broke the camera in the process of taking it apart. I did identify a few potential solutions for the thermal issues, but by the time I managed to fix the camera, get it put back together, the improvement was, I don't wanna say marginal, but not nearly as much as I had hoped. 
I managed to get this specific camera to go reliably for about 20 minutes full, you know, from start to finish without overheating. And on a good day, I can push it from, you know, say 22 to 24 minutes. I have had a couple of flukes where this thing has gone significantly longer, but when shooting podcasts, I really had to limit myself to 20 to 22-ish minutes in length. Now, lately I've figured out a workaround for this camera, and the simple fact is it's got a micro HDMI port on the side. So I bought an external USB capture device for my computer, and I've been simply capturing the video straight to my computer's hard drive through the camera. Since I'm never pressing record on the camera, that gets around the whole temperature issue. But that means I'm tethered to a computer, which I don't really want to do. So that leads me to where I'm going now. And that is I recently picked up, and if you follow me on Twitter, you probably saw this, a Panasonic GH5. And in many regards, this is a substantial step up from what I had been shooting in the past. Now, I strongly considered buying another Sony, an A6500, because it would have worked with all the lenses that I've already purchased for my A5100, and Sony's tried to fix some of the overheating issues, but what Sony's done to fix overheating has really just been more of another hack than anything substantial. They basically just upped the threshold at which the internal thermal sensors decide to shut the camera down. So the A6300 has notoriously been bad with overheating. It got about that same 15 to 20 minutes when you were shooting 4K. The A6500 included that new software feature to allow higher temperatures. But even then, the 6500 really can only go for maybe 40 to 45 minutes before temperatures start to become an issue based on the reports that I've seen. So I figure, you know what, I don't, I don't want to get myself into yet another compromise situation. And especially considering the A6500 body alone is $1,400, I started looking around and I ultimately decided, you know what, I'm just gonna go with the GH5. And I went this way for a few reasons. First is it's notorious for being great at video, like to the point where people basically say, if you're buying a Panasonic GH series camera, you're buying it for video. Not very many people buy these for stills. They've got an incredible feature set when working with video and lots of other YouTubers are using GH5s. It's still an interchangeable lens camera. The downside is that it's a different lens mount, so I'm basically gonna have to either buy an adapter and start running adapted glass, maybe go back to some of my old Nikon lenses, something like that, or invest in new Panasonic Micro Four Thirds lenses, which is another downside to going this way in that those lenses seem to be fairly expensive, at least the ones that would be most useful to me in the types of video that I shoot. So, you know, that there's a downside there with the cost of the lenses. The cost of the body was pretty substantial as well. GH5's brand new go for about 2,000 bucks. Now, thankfully, I didn't pay 2,000 bucks for my GH5. I managed to find an open box one on B&H's website for a little bit over $1,800. Now, $1,800 is still a lot of money for a camera, and I'm very thankful to all of you for watching these videos and supporting me on Patreon and everything else because it was saving up all of the ad revenue and viewer donations and everything that allowed me to buy this camera to be able to keep giving you awesome content. and. Yeah, the, that number was still pretty scary. I mean, 1800 bucks, I had to buy a lens with it, of course. So the lens was another about 200 bucks. So I'm still in about 2K on this camera. And cost, you know, that can be a major deterrent when you're trying to get stuff done on a budget. I would not have been able to pull this camera off a year or two ago. That's, you know, how much things have changed between then and now and how long I've been saving for this camera. This was not 
uh, you know, a quick like impulse purchase type of thing. I've actually been saving for this for quite a while. So cost is really the major downside to going with the GH5. The other downside and what kept me hesitating it for a little while was the sensor size. The Sony's, the A5100s, the 6000, 6300, that, that range of cameras is APS-C size sensor, which is really good for low light and also really good, again, for that depth of field that I really like in the footage that I shoot. The Panasonic G series, GH series use the micro four thirds format, which is a bit smaller. It actually sits somewhere between the A5100 and the one inch sensor on the RX10. Now one inch sensors, again, aren't useless by any means. I shot the RX10 exclusively for a couple of years and I've seen lots of footage that people have shot on micro four thirds sensors and it looks incredible. So. I don't think in terms of, you know, practical, practical usage, I'm really going to see a huge difference. I don't think I'm going to come to regret the decision to go, you know, micro four thirds instead of staying with APS-C or even stepping up to full frame. I think it's going to be fine, but it's one of those on paper types of things that always gives you a little bit of a pause. But there are just a ton of upsides when it comes to shooting the GH5 and even some of its predecessors like the GH4, GH3. The first big one that really, really helps out is not only do they not overheat when shooting video, but at least for the cameras that Panasonic sells in the US, there is no video recording limit. They don't have that standard 30 minute limit that most still, you know, otherwise still cameras tend to have. They just go, you press record and they will continue to record until the card fills up or the battery dies, something like that, which I know, you know, from practical purposes, is not something that is a huge deal for me because I've come up with workarounds like when shooting the podcast here, I've, I've come up with workarounds to get past either the overheating issue or that 30 minute barrier. But it is an incredible amount of peace of mind while I'm shooting because when you know that when you're shooting a clip and it may run long, and you've got a temperature limitation or you've got a recording length limitation in the back of your mind that can hamper you creatively. You know, like the previous episode that I did on that IBM ThinkPad, getting the hard drive swapped out and windows reloaded on it and all of that. I actually came across the overheating issue with my A5100 while shooting that episode. I ended up having to reshoot one of the clips. And at that point, I just decided, you know what, I'm doing all this work at my desk anyway. And I tethered it through my USB capture device and just recorded straight to my computer's hard drive as if I was shooting a podcast. Well, what if I was out somewhere wanting to do something? I mean, that's not an option. If I decide to, to expand creatively, which I continuously try to do, but it's a little bit slow going. But, you know, if, if I end up in a situation where I may need to shoot long, even if that doesn't actually happen, just knowing in the back of your mind, oh, think about the temperature. Oh, think about how long the recording's been going on for. If I need to stop, how do I cleanly do that? How do I restart? What do I do if it fails? That sort of thing. It, it can really hamper you. So, the fact that the GH5 just records for a very long time without any of those issues is a huge help. The other things that the GH5 does are all these little nitty gritty things that Sony either doesn't do or can't do. Now, there are a few small things that Sony does that I wish the Panasonic did. The biggest one being being able to recharge the battery through USB. For whatever reason, the GH5 can't do that. Even though there's USB Type-C port on the side, I love being able to just take my A5100 or my RX10 and plug it into a standard USB charger and charge the battery that way. Because when I travel, that means that's less stuff I need to carry. Whereas with the GH5, I need to carry a charger around with me, which kind of sucks. It's another thing that I need to throw in my bag. Now, 
I'm going to look into options that there may be out there for third-party battery rechargers that can connect through USB. But again, that's still yet another thing I've got to put in my bag instead of just using the standard charger that I would with my phone and being able to plug it straight into the camera. But a lot of the benefits really are on Panasonic's side. In terms of creative styles, it can shoot many more different bit rates and formats than Sony can. It gives you lots more internal options in terms of color and how you want to format your video. The GH5 can even support anamorphic lenses, which I'm probably not going to get into, but it's there. Just tons and tons of options and accessories. And then the third party market has really jumped in with this one where adapted glass, where you can use Canon or Nikon lenses on a Panasonic body is huge. So we're seeing lots of support from third party manufacturers to extend this camera system even further. So I have really high hopes for the future with this GH5. I think this guy is gonna be you know, kind of my primary camera going forward that I'll just shoot almost everything with. Whether it's a lockdown tripod shot or whether it's just a podcast episode or even if it's something handheld, it's got built-in five-axis image stabilization directly on sensor. So it produces really good handheld footage, which I've traditionally kind of shied away from. I really think this was the right purchase, but still... I'm left feeling that it's missing some stuff that Sony can do that other vendors can't do, like that micro four thirds size sensor. I really wish it was APS-C or bigger, like being able to charge through USB, like the broader support for lenses. I know that, you know, statistically, maybe Panasonic has the same number of lenses available for it that Sony does, but Sony has really taken on another class of photographers and those are the ones shooting full frame. So Sony's A7 and new A9 series cameras are really well regarded. And I'll weave this into a future podcast episode if you're interested in about just the overall future of photography and where traditional camera manufacturers like Nikon and Canon fit into it. But because Sony's had a big uptake in its still photo customers, that means that we've been seeing more support for lenses. Well, lenses that are good for still photos, often but not always, but often are also good for video. So it ends up being a big bolster to that entire ecosystem. Whereas with Panasonic, we're not seeing that. We're mostly seeing people buy them for video, so while there's lots of really good cinema lenses that have been made available for the Micro Four Thirds format, they tend to be really expensive. And that's the other downside that I have with Micro Four Thirds is, yeah, I know Panasonic has some less expensive models, but those tend to be hampered by the same recording length limitations, that sort of thing. The GH5 Plus lenses is going to be much more expensive. I would say maybe a worse bang for buck than something like the A5100. This combination right here, the A5100 body with the 35mm f1.8 lens, this whole thing probably goes for 700 bucks. And this will shoot really, really nice 1080p video. So nice that, you know, it's really only been the overheating that's caused me to want to move away from this camera. Going to 4K would be nice, of course, and I'm sure with the, the GH5, I'm gonna be moving that way sooner rather than later, but for 700 bucks, Sony gives you really good bang for buck. And that's where I can't help but feel that there really is no perfect camera right? It's a matter of coming up with all of these different things that are important to you, all of these different features and bits of functionality and everything, and trying to get something that works, trying to just, you know, come up with the pros and cons and kind of pick your battles, you know, pick exactly what's most important to you and what you can live without, and then just, you know, running through spec sheets on cameras to find which ones tick which boxes. 
you know, for a long time, the Sony cameras ticked the boxes that I needed to have ticked. But as time has gone on and with, you know, now that I'm doing podcast episodes, especially out of the car, because I just used my Sony action cam in the car for those, you know, with the overheating, the long, the long record time and all that for these podcast episodes here in the office, you know, my priorities ended up changing. And of course, with wanting to move to bigger, bit, you know, better quality and more cinema-like features, all that sort of thing, you know, my priorities changed. And at this time, I've decided the GH5 simply meets more of my needs than the Sony does. Now, it may be completely different for you. And that's the blessing and the curse of the current market for cameras is that cameras seem to be able to conform to pretty much anyone's needs. There, if you've got specific needs, if you've got that list of things that you want and, and have to have out of a camera, chances are there's at least one camera out there on the market that will meet those needs. The problem is when you need a camera that does everything or when you need a camera that meets certain needs but doesn't have any of the downsides that may otherwise come with that model. So what I'm getting at here is while I may start shooting most of my footage on the GH5, I am by no means going to be getting rid of any of my Sony cameras because these do things still that my GH5 can't, at least at the price point. I mean, this is all sunk cost. You know, I bought my RX10, I bought my 5100, I bought a few lenses for it. Could I turn around and sell all of this old equipment and put it towards the new platform? You know, go and, and use it to buy micro four thirds lenses. Yeah, I could, but I wouldn't get as much for it as I put into it to begin with. So right now, these older cameras are worth more to me to keep than they are in monetary value. And that's another thing to think about. So to recap, cameras are awesome. They've been incredible in terms of what they can do, but despite all the technology, there's still plenty of frustrations and I don't really think that's gonna change anytime soon. So sorry again about the waffle. Uh, if you're expecting something different, you know, maybe we'll ta tackle that in a future episode. If there is something specific you want me to talk about with regard to cameras, because it is something that I tend to try to keep up on, at least try to, to read up on and keep, you know, near to the ground about, you know, all the time. There's lots of different YouTube channels that I follow and lots of different websites that I, I watch and plenty of cameras that I play with. If there's something specific about photography that you want to have me talk about, how I do something or you know, what I think about certain topics or whatever, be sure to shout those out down in the comments below. I'd be happy to, you know, go off on future tangents and waffles on topics of your choosing. Also, I get questions a lot about people wanting to know, are there RSS feeds available for these podcast episodes? And the answer is yes. It's available through Patreon. This is a feature that they turned on not too long ago, which I'm really happy that they did. Basically, if you support me over on Patreon, you will get access to a private RSS feed that you can feed into the podcast app of your choice. And as soon as I upload a new episode, you will get notified to it and an audio only version will be delivered to you. Usually these episodes go live for Patreon supporters several days before they go up here on YouTube. And also I've got that feature able, uh, enabled, I should say, for Patreon supporters at all contribution levels. I'm not saying only if you give me a ton of money or anything, far from it. As low as a dollar a month will get you access to that RSS feed and you'll end up helping to support the channel so that maybe I can, you know, buy more lenses or something like that. Anyway, I do appreciate your support. Big shout out to all of my current Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. I hope you enjoy these podcasts, getting them early, the RSS feeds working great and all of that. But in any event, if you like this episode, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.